This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Boz Digital Labs, and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. The basic setup for all those records, whether it was Temple Dog, Pearl Jam, was like the London Bridge sound, room sound, drum sound. There's a brick wall, one end of the studio, the drums go up there. It's like cement, uplifted floor with a brick curved wall. We just set them next to each other, you know, stereo pair of U87s. It was, the room was so well designed and made. You, you hit the drums in there, it just sounded awesome. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Boz Digital Labs, offering you the coolest plugins for your mixes, like the Hoser XT and Plus 10 dB Signature Series. You can transform your drums with Sasquatch Kick Machine or Transgressor, get massive bass with Big Clipper, or add width and depth using Mongoose and Imperial Delay. All Boz Digital Labs plugins are available as fully functioning, no time limit free trials, so you can check them out on your mixes right now. Just go to bozdigitallabs.com or click the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with the unique Golden Drop capsule design. The Black Hole Series BH-1S and BH-2 microphones with the hole in the middle for a -a one-of-a-kind shock mount combine innovative industrial design with careful craftsmanship to bring a world-class sound to your studio, resulting in a level of quality and detail in your recordings that you won't find in other mics. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR right now to get an incredible 50% off. My guest today is Dave Hillis, who started his career as a 17-year-old guitarist for the legendary thrash metal band Mace in the mid-80s on Enigma Records and Black Dragon Records and touring with the likes of Slayer, Anthrax, Raven, Death Angel, and Testament. Dave also spent 10 years alongside legendary producer Rick Parashar at Seattle's famed London Bridge Studios during the birth of the grunge era, where he worked as the engineer on Pearl Jam's debut album 10, Mother Love Bone, the movie soundtrack for singles, Alice in Chains, Blind Melon, The Seattle Symphony, Love on Ice, and many others. Dave's producing and engineering credits include the Afghan Wigs, the Twilight Singers, Kevin Martin of Candlebox, and he's even worked with comedian Dennis Leary, among many others. In 2011, Dave opened Star Lodge Studios in Seattle, a private mix and overdub room featuring vintage and modern recording tools and his beloved Ampex half-inch tape machine for analog magic. And he now lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he recently works from a new multi-purpose performance hall recording studio called The Sanctuary at Mr. Small's. Dave also creates and records his own music with bands like Sybil Vane and The Heavenly Music Association, and most recently, Dave has crossed over to house and electronic music with his alter ego, Low Res, featured on major motion film soundtracks. Please welcome Dave Hillis to Recording Studio Rockstars. Dave, are you ready to rock? I'm ready. Dude, glad to have you here, man. It's great to be here. Um, and so t- tell us a little bit about, um, more about like, you know, who you are and how you got started out in recording. I mean, you've got a pretty great story to tell about you know, playing music, but then also being part of the beginning of this grunge scene. And now it looks like you're working out of a beautiful facility up there in Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I started out, you know, as, a, um, you know, a heavy metal kid playing guitar. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, I just 
got into it that way. Um, the difference was like, I, I really wasn't good at learning, um, cover songs or learning songs. And I would try to start, I wanted to start a band right away, probably before I was even good enough, uh, definitely before I was good enough. And, um, I couldn't really play songs, uh, like, you know, whatever the latest Judas Priest or whatever was. And so I started just, uh, writing like right away and making my own songs up. Yeah. Um, and why everything started so early for me is, is because of that. So like I, I started searching out places to record like right away, like these little eight track places in a suburb of Seattle. Um, okay. So you were growing up in Seattle and I was getting into in the Seattle. recording scene. Yeah. yeah. Originally from New York, from Brooklyn, but my parents moved out to Seattle. Um, so my, uh, preteens and early and you know from there it was all seattle uh and um so i I started searching out recording studios not knowing anything or what i was doing or what you know an eight track to a four track to what i had no idea anything i just wanted to record this i was just you know gangbusters and trying to be a rock star at the time you know as a teenager would be and um so like I did that a few times and was gaining more confidence and um, playing with some different people I could find. And before you knew it, I I just had blind ambition. Um, just that lot of just wasn't really afraid to go for it. Um, not that anybody was doing that around me, especially at that time. This, this is you know in the '80s, so it was before uh, the grunge and all that hit. Yeah. And I just started. I made a cassette and started sending them out to labels like. To major labels. Like I worked part, my first job was working at a record store, a mom and pop record store. So, um, I thought, well, if I have to have a job, that's perfect. Right. And so, uh, I just started copying down label addresses and and sending things out just really amateur. Yeah. And, um, and as the metal, the independent metal scene started growing a little bit, I'd see these records coming in and I noticed, uh, you know, metal blade records and I'd, I'd send a demo to them at the same time, I found about this guy named Jeff Gilbert, who was working with the managers from a then unknown band, Queensryche. And he said they were selling demos or people, local bands demos at their record store in, in West Seattle. So I drove out there, got my license, drove out there and said, started putting my cassettes there. They ended up putting on a compilation called Northwest Metal Fest. So the same year... And I got a, re- a letter back from Metal- Brian Slagle from Metal Blade. So that same year, we got accepted to be on um, Metal Masker 5 on Metal Blade mm-hmm. and the Northwest Metal Fest in Seattle, which had like Metal Church on it. And Metal Masker 5 had, you know, they always had some band that was going to be uh, big off off that. So we instantly, at, before I knew it, 17, we, we, had, we were out on vinyl That's and getting – and getting in fanzines. And, and so it was just, I was off and running and just skipped that whole kind of cover band thing. Um, and we just never really knew what we do. And it just kept progressing a couple lineup changes. And, and then we ended up recording a full record, uh, at a 24 track place I found. And, you know, the production was, you know, they were all horrible productions, but we did some touring and got lucky breaks at, these opening acts, these, you know, bigger bands like Slayer and stuff who were, weren't that big yet. You know, they were all on their first tours. So, but we got really popular in the underground and, and the fanzine thing. Um, after that kind of, we couldn't go to Europe, the, the guitar player, or I mean, the singer got in some trouble, couldn't get a passport, kind of ended up to the, <laughs> ended up to the demise of the band. And I was like, at that point now I was ready. I wanted to go bigger and, and do something no doubt. I mean, going to Europe, I mean, you know, you guys were probably huge in Japan, right? <laughs> we, we actually were. I mean, it's so silly, but we were. We were in the, we were in the top 20 of Burn, the Burn charts over there, which were the charts you wanted to be. And we were, it was funny looking at the charts in like Krang magazine uh, that we'd get. And, it, you know, we'd be in the charts with Ozzy and, you know, Jesus Priest and then, you know, Saxon or something, whoever was popular at the time. And it was like, whoa, you know, like we're kind of semi-famous over there. And, um, That's great. and we were in all the magazines. So it was, it, it was to us that at that age, it was seemed pretty big time. You know, there's no real money or anything, but it was, we now, were doing it. How important were records to you at that point? I mean, 
watching um, this video, Rockstars, that I included in the YouTube playlist of um, one of your Mace shows, and just watching you guys play, I'm just reminded that, you know, um, I mean, you guys were like, we're doing kind of thrash metal. Uh, so we start, yeah, we start out totally heavy metal and then... But it's kind of prog a little too. I mean, like there's complex yeah. riffs, right? Right. And then we and then we got met up with this band, the Keys and stuff, that crossover thing. It was right in the beginning of that. And we got into that. So we were the first band that started like going getting more thrashy and more punk rock in mm-hmm. with our metal. Well, it just it just seems like it was a reminder to me that when it's that much fun to just play the music, I wonder if you care as like the live show may mean more to you than whether the record sounds totally amazing or not. Oh, what, no, what yeah, do you we, remember about all that? Yeah, it was all about the live thing. Um, I we just didn't I didn't really understand the importance or or what even good quality was yet or anything. Um, but I was learning what it was like going into a studio um, pretty quickly and without no knowledge or nothing. And I think um, some of the engineers and people at that time got a just well, I'll tell you one story. They got a kick out of us. One, one. So the recording we did that ended up making it on um, the, the compilations, Metal Massacre and Northwest Metal Fest, was we went to the studio in Seattle that I'd heard about, and um, and I was trying out like everywhere. I'd save up my money, and we just totally we paying for this ourselves, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, you know this, and it was cheap studio time, and we wouldn't get that long anyway. But we went to this place that had. Um, Goldie McJohn and, and this guy Gordy, Goldie McJohn was the keyboard player for Steppenwolf. And, nice. and Gordy played guitar on, what's that? I forget the band, but it's he, teeny bitsy yellow polka dot bikini. Oh, right. Whatever. Oh, okay. whatever so these are like these older guys, hippie guys, you know, probably stoned out of their mind. And we come in and they, I remember like, we start playing one of those songs and they're just looking at us like, with their mouths open, like, what is this? Like, where are you going? <laughs> they had, they were just blown away, but so like into our energy and, uh, and just like, wow, we don't even, you know, this is crazy, but we love it. Um, yeah. so we, they get a kick out of us and, and, and some didn't get us at all. Some did, but, uh, after the, after that had ended, um, you know, I started getting wise, like, oh man, these other bands records are sounding good. They're sounding better than us. So what are we doing wrong? Um, and so I, after that, I had started a couple other different bands. I played around with genres, everything from, you know, goth, goth kind of stuff to mm-hmm. James addiction stuff, just trying to find my, and, and, you know, really it was right. It was like around 89, 88, 89. And that's when like, all these bands that are famous now, all of us in that scene were really trying to find, find what the new a, sound. What, what why was Seattle book? an important place for music and recording? I mean, you know, when we're at the, in hindsight, we're aware of Seattle being this scene that 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 birthed grunge. But like, why Seattle? I mean, is it because I, it's sort of on the West Coast with LA, or nothing to do with that? Um, I mean it what it had to do with LA really. I mean, everybody's influenced from that. Um, you know, I mean, the guys from Alice in Change, they were so influenced by Guns N' Roses. I mean, that was mm-hmm. a big thing. Every, I don't know. There was just a lot of, like, there was just that generation that our age group where there was a lot of people who wanted to be in a band. I mean, yeah. there was just, there was just this thing and it happened to just have, um, a scene, uh, you know, I think it just comes around. It was just a magical time just where people started studios and there were, everybody was very DIY, you know, doing their own shows or so. I, I don't know. It was just one of those times in that particular place. Now, were you um, crossing paths with Larry Crane who started tape up from up there as well? You know, in Portland, I guess. I, not at all. I, we were, I've never really worked out of Portland. Like we'd play there throughout the years, even later on when, you know, I was on major labels. I'd play through, played there many times, but I never was really, uh, never did any recording down there or involved in the scene. I didn't meet Larry. I met him briefly. I don't even think he knows who I am. I met him briefly at a Grammy, uh, uh, thing at one of the studios, one of the panel or seminar type things. 
briefly met them, but yeah, we had, yeah, Portland is, yeah, we did a band called one, my, actually my first major label engineering job was for a band called Love and Ice who were from Portland. They got signed to Interscope right around that whole signing frenzy. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I didn't really, it didn't mix that much with Portland. Um, <clears throat> and what about the, the Nirvana scene starting up there where you cross, where you, Mixing with those guys, because a funny thing about my perspective on the whole Seattle grunge scene is you had, on the one hand, you had Nirvana starting their thing, and they were trying to be the antithesis of Guns N' Roses. But then you also had, like, Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden that were all right in the middle that, like, I think respected the Guns N' Roses thing, but also respected the Nirvana thing at the same time. Yeah, like, well, it goes back to, like I was saying, everybody was just, you know, even... If you go back a little further, everybody was coming out of being kind of a heavy metal guy of some sort. Yeah. You know, um, and there was just a few different paths that people kind of lean towards a little bit this way or a little bit or over that way. You know, um, even when you first heard like Green River or the bands that became Mud Honey and you know, all that stuff, they were, you mm-hmm. know, they were they didn't know yet whether they were Aerosmith or they were I- Iggy Pop and the Stooges. You know, they were. You know, everybody was just experimenting and there yeah. weren't really any rules. So, um, you know, I, I didn't really, I mean, I did cross paths with them a little bit, but they kind of came out of a different part. You know, they weren't really a Seattle band necessarily. <laughs> right. Then they were like from Aberdeen. I, I seen them play when their first shows didn't think, but, you know, you didn't, when you're in the scene and you're all playing, you're all like, we different bands. It, it was musical chairs, different re- rehearsal rooms, rehearsal spaces. That, you know, we'd see each other all the time, not so much Nirvana, but when they were playing, I saw them. And, um, actually later on when I was in Sylvain and we were on Island, uh, Chris no had a rehearsal room that was right next door. to us. So it, it was, you know, small enough city, you're going to run into people, but mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, like with say the Pearl Jam guys and stuff like that, I would, we would run into each other all the time, whether it's, you know, at a party or whatever, or we're all hanging out with the same people or going out and chasing the same girls, whatever it might've been, you know, it was, we all crossed paths yeah. one way or another. Yeah. And also the stuff that's really memorable at that age is, you know, whether or not it was just a really fun night, then, then the people you were hanging out with were super cool oh. and the band was great. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, it was all, and every, you know, you're so self-centered there and everybody, everybody's just caring about what they're doing and then just seeing what parties exactly, you Don't know? Don't you so, miss it, man? Don't you miss being that self-centered? I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I know. Well, you could get away with it then, you know? Yeah. Well, that's all, cool. Well, uh, let me ask you a question about, you know, you're going through the recording experience with Mace. You guys are all about this high energy what do you feel like you learned about the the right way to capture high energy in the studio? Huh. Well, I mean, well, you know, it's totally per case, you know. Um, like, if you're talking, like, for instance, a, a Pearl Jam or an Alice in Chains, for instance, weren't very high energy in the studio. I mean, they were like, concentrated and working mm-hmm. very, very focused and working. It wasn't like a crazy band coming. We want to do it live and blah. I mean, well, Pearl Jam was very live, but not with that over the top punk rock attitude. They didn't, they didn't really have that. So it depends what, what you you know, it depends with them. It was more about, you got to find the personality of the band. Um, yeah. Like for instance, with them, it was, they definitely wanted to be a band and it, they wanted to be live. Now there was overdubs, of course, and all that, but just dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, takes, so many reels of tape, you wouldn't believe, until they felt they got that take right. Um, right, that's right. We're, we're talking about, <laughs> let's remind everybody, we're talking about the era of tape recording when in order to do keep endless takes, you're talking about stacks and stacks of boxes oh, we, of expensive tape. Yeah, and and they were fortunate enough at that time. They didn't have a giant record deal, but they had they had a budget. So we were fortunate at the time that, to be able to do that. And I remember um, uh, if you were like looking out from the 
the board into, there was a window that you could see into like the lobby, the uh, living room area type thing, the rec room or whatever you want to call it. And uh, the, we kind of stacked tapes there on the ledge and it was so full like you couldn't see the window was blocked and everything. It was a big window. Like we just had stacks of tapes, which I'll get into a funny story about later, but um, because there were so many tapes and Mm -hmm. takes that, I mean, we took just the, you know, that's another thing people forget too, is that in those records, no pro tools, no editing of that sort like that. And the fact that, uh, you know, when you do that many takes, you got to remember you need studio time to listen back to them all. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> just, just to go through them all and have the producer take notes and then any edits or thing. I mean, that's right, which, a whole process that people forget about. Even in Pro Tools, you need that time, but at least you can kind of go do it on your laptop at the oh, coffee shop with a pair of headphones. It's so much quicker than loading reels and like all that. But yeah. Um, well, okay, cool. So, um, let me ask that same question in a diff- different way. Sure. Um, what is a way that you have seen uh, a band with high energy, like s- the the recording process, kind of spoil it and ruin it and kill that high energy by doing it the wrong way? Um, yeah, <laughs> that can definitely happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes, like I said, you got to call. It, it's a producer call, or if you're engineering producing, you know, you've got to you got to figure it out, like. You know, if it makes more sense just to put up a couple, you know, have them in the same room and just globo off the amps or something, then you go for that. Is that because yeah. it, it's going to and, you know, you can make that work. And if it's the right band that needs that type of thing, you want that to work. Um, so I, I just feel like, you you know, you you know, like there's just times when you have to go, okay, you know, I really love how, you know, if there's times I'm, I got, you get used to being able to separate everything. And then sometimes you got to go, man, it's just not going to work for them. Yeah. You know? And, and also it's about being, you got to adapt. Like um, when I worked with the Afghan wigs, you know, Greg would want to sing in, in the control room. That's just how he wanted to do it. Um, Headphones or just listening through speakers? He just wanted to listen through speakers or headphones, but he liked, he, that's how he wanted to do it. So you just adjust. Um, there, there's a guy named Sean Smith, a great artist, singer who he worked with Stone from Pearl Jam a lot on the on their side project. Brad mm-hmm. he had a couple of singles and stuff like that. He needed complete privacy. I mean, he would put up curtains, a wall of things behind him. He just nobody could look at him. You know, nothing. Didn't want to yeah. sing with the band. And then, you know, then there was like with Pearl Jam where you had to have everybody have eye. We had separation, but everybody was looking at each other. Everybody had eye contact. Um, So, you you know, you just got you got to work with the band, you know. And but you're right. I mean, it could kill. It can tell if it's a certain band and they're feeling like that and that sounding coming across. It just it's not going to work. You know, it's interesting to me. A couple of things. One is you um, when you do this for a long time you begin to sort of quickly know which direction you want to go with the band and setting up. And, and you you begin to get a feel for whether or not the singer might be the one who needs to be have total privacy versus whether everybody should have eye contact. Um, yeah, you just, just develop that, yeah. Yeah, I forgot and what the other part of my thought was. Hey, well, <laughs> let, me, let me elaborate a little further. It's like, that's what... Um, some of like the earlier records, not only in, in the grunge scene, but, you know, all kinds of different scenes were because they weren't, you know, they were in a studio where maybe there, there was only one ISO booth or there were none. Thus, that that made that sound. And that's what people started loving or getting familiar with. And as a band might mature and get into a bigger studio, like, well, it doesn't sound as good. I always loved the first album, you know, mm-hmm. different things like that. It's because sometimes the lack of things is really what makes. Yeah, stuff the work. challenge. The yeah. challenge, and it it just gives the character and the uh, the essence of what what it's all about, and then you always miss that, you know. So I guess that's what the other part of what I was going to say was. So I just spent all weekend in the studio with a bunch of my friends recording. Um, we did eight songs and stayed up all night and, and had a blast. But I, but we did isolate um, amps from the drum room, and there are times where I'm listening and I'm like, yeah, the guitar doesn't it doesn't gel with the drums, you know, and I'm reminded of, you know, occasionally you might want to like leave the door to the ISO room open, or you might want to actually bring the amp into the room with the drums and just like let it all live together in one space because 
it creates a cool thing. But y- yeah. y- you don't always know ahead of time either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, when I started working at London Bridge, we had the ability to have ISA rooms and a great big live room and it's a beautiful studio. And then as time went on, I saw different people work different ways. And then when I got my own time to do things, um, and we would, you know, Rick had his way of working when I worked for him as an engineer, as his engineer. So, you know, I got, okay, this works. Like it's everything he does sounds great. And it sells a lot of records. (laughs) So you're like, you don't want to move from that. But then, when other people come in, like I said, oh, wow, that's totally different. We don't usually do it that way. Or uh, that would that gave me confidence to experiment in different setups in the studio. And, you know, re- ultimately, they all worked. I was like, and that opened my eyes up. Like, you can make, it can all work. Yeah. It's just, there's just different little challenges or what, or not even challenges. It just gives you a different palette to paint with, really. Um, and they can all work and they can all have their own thing to it, you know? Well, it's encouraging because it reminds us that like whoever you are and wherever you're listening to this and whatever your studio setup is, it's going to work if you just keep working at it. Yeah. Keep, I mean, keep figuring could, it out, you know? Yeah. And sometimes you just take, you just take a little more time while you're, while you're getting that initial setup going until stuff starts feeling right. And I mean, I can't stress enough how important just getting the perfect headphone mixes for people. Mm-hmm. If there's any, like I was one advice I was going to give, man, if there's like the best thing I learned how to do is when I started out as like an assisting, like a, you know, a major producer or anything, get your headphone mixes right for all the band and everybody's happy. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a good, you're going to have a way better session. Like that just fixes everything and everybody's happy with you. Like, <laughs> what, um, so for somebody who's listening to this, um, what does that mean to get the headphone mixes right? Does that mean like you need to know some magic spell of headphone no, mixing? No, you just, no, you take, you take the time and you make sure everybody's happy with it. You listen to what they're listening to, you know, don't just think, oh, I'm turning a knob here. Mm-hmm. And that has to be more. And then you go out and listen to their headphones. And you're like, oh my God, you're listening to it like this. You know, you got to go out there and check. You got to, that's like one detail that you got to really stay on top of. I think is if you want your sessions to go good and really be uh, most productive, I found that out that, you know, know your headphone system, whatever it might be as elaborate or not. Um, and just make sure that, you know, everybody's happy with it. And yeah. then you can, and then, then there's none of that frustration going on sometimes people won't voice their frustration and and they're not mm-hmm. really hearing what they should be hearing and you don't even know that mm-hmm. and they don't even know they don't know they don't what know. a good headphone mix is yet right and especially if they're new to it you know um you know and it may just be as simple as things just need to be louder or quieter than you realized exactly you know um and of course the drummer's gonna have a completely different <laughs> i that because his drums are right you know so loud and where he's sitting so those kinds of things This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, what do you have feelings about uh, these, you know, m- complex headphone mixers where everybody builds their own mix versus, um, you know, I, just I mean, I think they're great. Two, two I think they're great. Mix? I think they're great. Um, you know, most of the major, you know, you see them now everywhere. They weren't as common. Um, I mean, at London Bridge, we, for years, we just used like off the board consoles, things, which was kind of a nightmare. That was the biggest yeah. part. I guess that's why I learned how important it was is <laughs> because it was really difficult. But yeah, these new monitors that, it, you know, but I've done it all. I've done it with just, you know, I've recorded in every situation imaginable. So it's like I've done everything from, you know, just one headphone splitter, you know, from Radio Shack. And mm-hmm. and we're working off the same, you know, you just, 
just, you know, it's just a thing. You got to take note of it and you just work with whatever you have. Well, one of the things that I'm reminded of with headphone mixes here is um, because I have a variety of different headphones, like Mm -hmm. manufacturers and stuff, and they all sound different. You plug different headphones into the exact same jack and they might be a completely different sound. You know, one one particular orange headphone that I've got may have the right kind of low end to make a guitar player feel like it's a full sound, whereas the other ones sound thin and, and you know, vapid. I haven't that, used that word in a while. Vapid. <laughs> that, um, that's totally true. And, you know, uh, if you, if you uh, you know, can afford to have that and do that, that's great. Uh, I mean, like I said, I've worked in like every situation where with uh, the worst headphones to multiple different kinds. I mean, it depends, but that's just something, you know, like I say, it's, it, it's something that I picked up early to, if you can get that sussed out, um, it's good. But yeah, definitely different headphones, always different. And then you're, and if you don't know that and people are using different stuff, you're like, you know, you could be all over the place. So you, you've got to, like, okay. I, I would just go out and listen to the mixes in their phones. Like you first to hear what they're hearing bought one once in my life and they were really bad back then too anyway yeah. well, and, that, uh, that's I, the answer to that question <laughs> yeah I met, you know that you know what i think the bass player might have well i was just curious whether you had um ever found wireless rigs to be useful in a studio for guitars um, i've never done that in but the there you go that's the end of that so long cables <laughs> are the way to go rock stars i've just i've i don't know if it is i've never i i don't know i've never even thought of that Actually, I should clarify that. Long cables are the way to go if that's what you need to get from like the control room out to the other room. But it can be a challenge. What are some of thought, the thoughts that you have, uh, Dave, about getting great guitar tones, you know, from the guitar to the amp and cable runs and all that kind of stuff? Oh, man. Um, where do you start? Uh, being a guitar player, um, I mean, that's kind of what... <clears throat> Kind of, if I have a specialty, that was kind of my area, obviously. Um, later on became a total, you know, pedal nerd collector, mm-hmm. amps, you know, very, I was very deep into guitar and tones and all that. That was definitely my my passion for a long time. When I started working with Rick, uh, that's kind of where he let me go, uh, really gave me my, where I stood strong with him is because... Um, I was a guitar player. He, he's, his background was more, uh, you know, he's a classic trained pianist and synthesizers and, um, uh, and just basic arrangements, you know, really all around musician and technician, uh, as far as engineering. So I knew more about like, what's a cool guitar tone, what's a cool pedal to use is, you know, things like that. So for instance, when we like back to the Pearl Jam record again, I was a, I understood and, and, and you know, me and Mike McCready had shared rehearsal rooms before in different bands. So like I knew them. So and I'd study their other bands, like Stone stuff. So we were all like competitive guitar players around town. Um I love it. competitive guitar player. You know what I mean? We were all like jockeying for a position at one point or another. And um so I uh um I knew what they were doing and I understood where they were going. I know that, you know, and and being like, you know, working at the rec store helped me a lot. I like was exposed, you know, I, I, I would listen to music all day and like, you know, you'd get your turns listening to, uh, you had your, your hour to play whatever or what with the different employees. So some guy, you know, a lot of the guys, uh, I mean, the owners were into blues. So, you know, I was hearing every tone amount. They were always trying to turn me onto that or mm-hmm. the other guys might be into English stuff and whatever. So I was, I studied a lot of that. And so like, I knew, I knew that, you know, Mike loved Steve Ray Vaughn and one, you know, he got this Fender Bassman and we used, I remember we used my Marshall, we used his Marshall, you know, I knew what they're going for, what, you know, we should try this. Let's put, you know, let's mic both these amps and blah, blah, blah. And we, you know, bust a lot of different mics down and, and, you know, Rick would turn me on to his tricks with that. So in that sense, um, I have all kinds of, of, uh, I mean, I just love getting cool and unique tones and I love yeah. stacking them and layering them, whether it's overdriving an Echoplex or just using crappy pedals or I have a delay pedal, an old Roland Boss delay pedal that kind of broke. I don't know what happened. It goes on and everything, but it doesn't, 
the knobs don't work. Mm-hmm. So it's set at one weird spot. And then so and I had to get another one just like it so I can have it for real. It works. But I'll just use that one sometimes because it's stuck at this weird. Right. It's got like the it, perfect sound. It's like when yeah. distortion pedals, um, when the battery starts to die and yeah. you hit the, just the right sweet spot, you get the perfect distortion, right? Right. I, I So I, I just experiment. I mean, I love that stuff. And I love with different tones on top of other tones. And, what and are I'm, some um, What are some of the guitar um, chains and miking techniques that you do remember from working with Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains? With, with Pearl Jam, it was, you know, that was cut very... Um, Pretty straightforward. Not as, I mean, Temple of the Dog was really straightforward. But Pearl Jam was, it was really classic rock kind of stuff, you know. Um, you know, you just, you had a, like I said, I think we had like a Fender. He he was really still, he had a little bit of money to get some gear. I remember he got a nice 59 basement. Uh, he was really stoked about that. You know, we mic'd that and a, like a half stack couple different mics in the cabinets, like I said, and, and then a couple of channels and Neve down to a one. And then we'd overdub them. Just, it was just really simple stuff like that. Just getting clear, good tones, EQ'd right, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you say a like, couple of channels, what, what would that mean? Well, in other words, we would like, say if I had a 57 and a Sennheiser on one cabinet and I don't know if, 414 or something, whatever mics that we mix them around, maybe U87, who knows. Um, those would come up on three channels on the on the Neve, EQ mm-hmm. different ways, checking the phase, and then um, bounce. Then all those, I'd mix those together, blend them however you want to get your tone, and then that would be track to one. Mm-hmm. We'd print that to one track on tape. So you'd have multiple mics in, in different cabinets going to to make up one sound. One of, the, to t- one of the things that I, I find really fun about blending guitar tones together like that on a console or on faders is that the console, the EQ and the faders becomes like these, it's like you're, you're doing, you're cooking or something. Oh, yeah. You're like, you're painting, mixing colors and you just, you just start sculpting until something happens and who cares Ex- where, where the fader was set? That just sounds cool. So you're done, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, so you can have, I mean, one fader might be barely in there, but it just adds ah, something else. And then, and when you, we were lucky, you know, having that knee the, with the 1081 EQs, they were just, you can, I mean, talk about sculpting. I mean, to me, those, you can just, that's what they're for, so sculpt. Mm-hmm. You can cut up anything, but it never sounds bad. Um, and so you were able to really just, manipulate that that tone and that sound um so much that 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 was so you know from there i got very spoiled by that now do you find um that you're ever able to replicate that in the digital world sort of like bringing a few mics into pro tools and then blending it and sculpting it and printing it as one um yeah i mean i still do it into pro tools uh I'm I'm almost always doing that. I you know the best uh, obviously was like I say got a little spoiled doing it with a Neve, but um, console like that. But yeah, I still do that. Um, I'll, uh, later on, when we finally got, and we were pretty early on to get Pro Tools. Rick would not. I I was the one jumping in on that, and uh, Rick was very like he he couldn't he didn't trust it yet, <laughs> as it were, and. I was yeah. trying to talk him into it and it, it was still, you know, 16 bit then, you know, the converters weren't good. So, but we would, um, and we were like still, uh, we were sinking it, you know, so we weren't, he wasn't, he didn't want to commit to it, which is funny. Cause later on he totally got rid of tape and went into the box, which was hilarious to me to see the change. But, um, what I was getting at is there was a point where we were using, um, Oh, whatever that first, uh, guitar simulator amp simulator that was on oh the, amp farm amp farm right we were using amp farm and we got some great sounds of some records uh nothing you'd probably recognize but some other label records that came through and um we would we started uh, experimenting a lot where we do our regular tracking um and then we'd also have some amp farm tracks that we would sculpt with the, with an evq and then blending them in with the other ones. And that, I, we usually use that Fender 
was it a base? I think it was a basement amp on yeah. the on amp farm. And we were like building some like amazing tones that way. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I remember when Amp Farm first showed up in uh, Rockstars. That's Line Six. It was like their first offering. Yeah, it was a Line Six. That's right. Um, but it was just r- amazing to have something that was like a plug-in that you could it get was, a guitar sound. Mixing it with the the other sound, you know, your, the way you would regularly do it, it added a different dimension, which is something I I also found as kind of the same thing um, when I'd have time at the studio by myself. Uh, there'd be the tapes and, and the tape library was great. So I'd go in there and um, facelift by Alice in Chains was recorded at the studio. I didn't work on that. It was Dave Jordan who produced that record, but the tapes were there. And so, you know, if there's nobody around, whatever, one night, whatever, I would throw up different tapes and I, I threw the stuff up that he would do. And um, which was really cool to be able to do and i'm hearing he he would have all these different tracks of jerry's guitars that were like you know a, a mess of boogie amp track uh with and, th- and then he'd have like a, a rockman and then he'd have a marshall and he'd <clears throat> have all these really different crazy different types of amp things that were all sculpted only for highs mids and lows Mm-hmm. And then he'd blend them because you pull up a fader, any one of the faders alone. And this is true. It's all, I learned a lot from that um, on almost any of his tracks. Like you just pull up a kick drum, you pull up a bass, guitar, guitar track, and you go, man, that, those sound horrible. This can't be right. <laughs> you know, and then you push all the faders up and you're like, holy, you know, it sounds amazing. So it's like, that was something else to learn. Like you just, sometimes you just don't go for this sold up track and getting the biggest fattest thing in the world yeah you know when i learned that from that that wow he sculpted this to fit in together Mm -hmm. and all together it sounded giant you know so well that's pretty cool and you know and another thought that i have about um recording multiple mics on a guitar now of course you can do a couple of mics and and run them into pro tools you know get two sounds put them in um, and that's what we did this weekend. In fact, I was doing a 57 and a ribbon on the guitar amp. But one of the frustrating things for me is like, um, and one of the wonderful things about sculpting it when you capture it and putting it down to one track is like, then it's committed and you don't, you're not going to go fuck it up later by changing the thing. And when you have two tracks for one guitar in Pro Tools, you know, you're, you're always at risk of like constantly readjusting those two relative faders and it's like you're shifting the sands under your feet as you work on the music. And so what I did for this particular record is I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to bring them in on a stereo track and then put the trim plug in on it so that it's like, you know, it's got the right level balance so that at right. least it stays that way until it's time to mix, hopefully. I, I, I can agree with you more. I'm a huge fan of committing. I like to commit. Um, you know, if I got... If, if we've all decided that we got a good drum take and everything like that, like pretty much everything's getting committed, you know, I yeah. don't, uh, even effects sometimes I, I like to, I like to, you know, I mean, it, within reason, but I, I like to commit. I'm not afraid to do that. It's like, I, I think you're right. It's like, that's a great analogy. It's like the sands are shifting. Yeah. You keep changing the, the, the playing fields for yourself. You and know? then it's like, and then it's like you're chasing going what you had before and you can't ever get there. It's like, it's like chasing a demo. The demo always was better, you know? <laughs> so the question is, is the demo actually always better or do we just think it's better? <clears throat> I don't know, man. It's a lot of times better. Yeah. It's not for in my, me to in say. My, in my own personal world, I know uh, from my band that I was in, Civil Vane, that ended up signing with, well, your son of Polydor originally ended up moving to Ireland, but... The demo, we the song that really got a sign that they thought was going to be a hit, uh, the demo was just light years ahead. And it was recorded so poor, not poorly, but so basic, you know, just, it was a demo, quick yeah. demo. Um, and even the, even the demo before the demo, like, like the writing demo, like the, off a of four track or something, um, was better. And the, now the one for the record, of course, had, we brought in another mixer because we were fighting over it. We had all these, I mean, it was, there were so many dats of just, uh, 
that one song being mixed, it was just ridiculous. Trying to get it right, yeah. <laughs> Trying to get it right. And then everybody, and the few people who did know us from the, <clears throat> from the demo, including not, not only the band, we were like, man, the demo was so good. What happened? We are like, we don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, I remember hearing a story about Black <laughs> Rebel Motorcycle Club when they um, oh, first appeared on the scene. And yeah. they had recorded, I think they had done five song demo in their living room with a with a little Mackie board and, and an ADAT and they got this and they got signed for it. And then immediately the label pours like hundreds of thousands of dollars in to re-record or remix this stuff. And they end up doing the same thing going in circles. Um, you know, this is hearsay, so I might I might be a little bit not accurate, hundred percent accurate on this. But then they came back to those original demos and just released that for, you know, the, the couple of singles. I, I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. I, I love that record, the first record. I was, that was a big band for me. I like those guys. And there was a Jill Sobiel record that we did at the first studio I was at. Um, and uh, Happy Town uh, was the record. And and the song, we like, was going to be the single, and it got sent out to be mixed by somebody in a great studio, um, somebody a very... Uh, uh, an important name in mixing, actually. I'll just, I won't say who it was, but, um, and he did a great job mixing it. But when it came back, they ended up just going with the rough mix off of our Mackie board. Again, with ADATs, you know, because it just had the vibe in that moment. And sometimes there's, you know, that's the stuff that you can't always predict. I know, I know for, for my, the one that I was talking about, referring to my personal one was with the singer, our singer, who was great, just could never sing it like she sang it on the, the first time she sang it. It just, yeah. she sang it great each time, but it just something was missing. Like, it was just never quite the same. Vocals are a funny thing like that where, yeah. you know, there there were times where we tried to chase a demo vocal sound and performance, and we finally decided that it was because the band would sing it in that hallway of the rental apartment they had, and it just had a sound, you know, or whatever. And we could yeah. never duplicate that in the studio. Yeah, and and you know it depends on singers. There's some singers who can are just capable of doing that. They, that's just how they are. Uh, some of the more artistical ones, or I don't even know what you'd say, but uh, I know like with our singer, she just was. You know, I don't know if she ever sang any. I remember we used to have, when we were doing the real record, we'd have problems with that because she would never sing anything the same way twice exactly. So, like it would be frustrating producer because, you know, that's great. Just try it again, just like that. And it, she wouldn't do it the same way. Like she just couldn't, it was always just a little different each time. So you had to keep everything and, and, uh, you know, make sure you're ready to comp something. Yeah. Because. That's what, hence all the reels of tape on the, yeah. on the window, right? Yeah. Cool, man. Well, Hey, we'll take a break for just a sec. Rock stars. We'll be right back for the jam session. Um, and a reminder that you can find stuff we're talking about in the show notes, including a great YouTube playlist to just go listen to Dave's records and start checking out all this stuff. Um, if you know the Seattle scene and the gr- introduction of grunge, then this is great stuff to hear. If you don't, it's great stuff to hear because it's a whole world that's going to open up to you when you discover this music. So we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock. OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. 
If you want to design and build a great house, then you're going to need great tools. You could build it with an old hammer and some nails, but it's a whole lot easier to use an air compressor and a nail gun. Well, the same thing goes for mixing. If you really want to create a pro sounding mix, then it makes a lot of sense to start with a great toolbox of awesome plugins. This is where Boz Digital Labs comes in to help you get killer mixes easily, quickly, and creatively. Provocative will make your vocals sound lush and wide. Transgressor and Manic Compressor can help your drums leap out of the speakers. Gaty Weighty and Big Beautiful Door offer unique new ways to tighten up your tracks, while The Wall will make sure your mixes are in your face and competitive. And my favorite is Sasquatch Kick Machine, which can transform your kick drum from sounding like a home studio cardboard box into the perfect punchy kick without using samples or triggers. To download your unlimited trial of any plugin now or get one of Boz's free plugins, go to BozDigitalLabs.com and put the best in your mixing toolbox. Click the link below in the show notes to learn more. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting color and distortions. Make sure to check out the Black Hole series BH1S and BH2 with the awesome looking hole in the middle of the mic, combining innovative industrial design with meticulous electrical engineering to help your studio sound incredibly expensive for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the US, and 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, if you use the coupon ROCKSTAR, you will get an astonishing 50% off. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the BH1S. So what are you waiting for, rock stars? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars. We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Dave Hillis talking about the grunge scene in Seattle, his music that he's making now, and this new awesome studio you're working out of up in Pittsburgh. Um, you ready to jam, dude? I am. Uh, yeah. So I was going to make a comment uh, during our, our break there. I grabbed another coffee and I was reminded of, you know, this discussion of headphone mixes. So I had my band in here. The studio still is like, it, it hasn't been cleaned up since the session. <laughs> so it's still just a mess. The beer bottles are gone, but it's still like, you know, the trash still needs to be taken out and all that. And uh, two of the guys in the band walked through the uh, the the kitchen slash vocal booth and just just wipe out the entire headphone mixer catching their foot on the headphone cable. Oh god. Do you have any stories of uh, of just like, you know, studio disasters where you're just where the studio feels like this fragile spaceship sometimes where you can barely walk through. Yeah, let's see. Well, I uh if you yeah, if you're talking like to, like sessions that I totally screwed up on or something. Sure, or, yeah. Um, yeah, if it was my stuff or back when I was in a band, I didn't care. Right. Cause you're, you know, whatever. But, uh, when, if you're like engineering for a producer, for instance, and you know, you're the guy, you know, he's looking at you and you've got to be on it. And it's a, it's a real, it's a project, a big project. Um, you know, you kind of, I'm, I was always kind of nervous or, uh, yeah. you know, like, holy shit. Uh, so, well, there's, there's two classic ones that come to mind. So, uh, and one of them was on one of the bigger records I did, it was on uh, Pearl Jam. Uh, we were doing, so they, like I told you, they were doing take after take after take on everything. And, um, so this is going on, you know, day after day and, uh, Rick would go home, uh, kind of early, you know, we've been doing this for a while. And so you get burnt out. So, you know, my job was to stay there and, keep recording those takes right. and so um and make notes and then we'd audition him in the morning and he'd listen through and blah 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 uh so it's we're working on they're working on even flow and i remember it because i just well you know why i remember it because it sticks in my mind but they were like going over it and over and over and it's getting late now and i'm like i got my feet up on the board and i'm kicked back and they're playing over and over and i'm like you know, oh, one more time. And they're like, it's getting late, you know, at least two, three in the morning, you know, 
Mm-hmm. And they play this thing so many times, I can't, I lo- totally lost count. And um, so we're towards the end, and I'm getting tired. I'm kind of, you know, just staring at the knobs, things are, you know, getting blurry and stuff. I'm like thinking in my head, man, let's just call it. They're all sounding the same, you know, thinking in my head. I'm not saying anything. Right, right. And uh, so, you know, I, I have to keep an eye on the reels because we're, you know, doing tape. And um, so, you know, one more time, like, all right, you know, so go back to the marker. Well, for whatever reason, so, you know, I'm recording. And they're doing a take and it's going, it's going, sounding good, whatever. I, I don't even know at that point, you know, I'm just recording this stuff. And all of a sudden I hear this. <laughs> Oh, I know that sound. <laughs> and and I look back like, oh, God. And um, so I just like, don't do anything. You know, I'm just sitting there and I figure, oh, they're going to do it again. It's not going to even matter. They're going to do it again. And because um, they've been doing it again, it's like, you know, 40th time or something. I don't know. And so I'm not, I'm not sweating. I'm just like, as soon as they stop, I go, hey, let me put a new reel on or something. And um of course, it's coming to the end. And, oh, damn. And I hear this. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> all right. And they're all cheering out there. And, and I'm just going. Meanwhile, the tape is not on tape, the machine anymore. Tape is not. Off. Yeah, it rolled off. <clears throat> I'm like, oh, man, dude, what do I do? Because they were so stoked after this long. They feel they got it. And they want to come in and listen. They're like, "Let's, hey, can we come in? Oh, yeah, man. Why don't you guys go in and sit down for a minute? Let me get it rough together. You know, oh, so they man. go in there and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I, so I grab a reel up one of the, one of the reels that was stacked. And I'm like, I mean, I had like you know, some notes. I've looked at some ones that were starred, like once I starred, I grabbed one, quickly went to the end of it, did an edit, sliced it, put it on that one, made a quick edit, hoping they're not going to know. I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what else to do. I, I couldn't call Rick. Cause I'd called Rick in other times when, um, there was like, I lost, like he had me comping reels and I would lose, there's so many reels I lost track. I go, man, I can't, and I like almost crying dude. dude, don't be mad at me, but I can't find <laughs> this, this reel. I don't know. I put the comp over here. I could, you know, but, uh, anyway, cause there's like comps on top of the machine, on the side of the machine, on the couch, you know, everywhere. And I'm trying to juggle and I get lost sometimes. But anyway, in this particular time and I go, and so I just put it together and they, they go, all right, man, can we come in? I go, yeah, come on in. And I'm just, I rewind it. I'm playing it. And I'm just, you know, sweating. just sweating it, facing the board while they're all behind me listening, you know, sitting on the couch and standing, listening to it, getting into it. And, you know, if you're familiar with tape, you know, when the edit goes by, sometimes, you know, you could hear or right. see, you know, you know, you're, you, if, if it's not very loud, you'd hear like a you know, yeah. quick. You, you thought well, you thought doing a Pro Tools edit was hard, Rockstars. <clears throat> oh God! And, and I thought I didn't know if they were savvy enough to look and notice notice the tape, edit tape, or anything. So I'm keeping it loud, and I'm like standing in front of the machine, or I was, you know, kind of like blocking views and everything. <laughs> and it goes by. It goes by. I know where the edit goes by. and gets to the end, and they're happy. They're like, "Yeah, that's." that's great. I think that's the one. And they're like, all right, cool. You know, and I mark it and let, you know, know that that's the one they want Rick to hear that they're feeling that's the one. And they're all stoked about it. And and so I just didn't tell anybody. I just like, (laughs) I'm not telling anybody. And then I, should I tell Rick? You know, I don't know. Cause then I'm feeling stupid, you know? And so I just didn't say anything for the longest time and nobody really noticed. And I went like, Long time later, we're working on something. Rick's like, we're going through, we're starting to comp, getting everything organized. And he's like, did, what, did we do an edit on this or something? Why, I can't, you know, I'm like, yeah, don't you remember? <laughs> like we had, you know, and that's been a secret. Nobody's known. I'm like. Really? It's now on recording studio I, rock stars. I I've, I've, might have shared to a couple of people. It's never been like really publicly known, but um, wow, yeah, that's so incredible. That's, that's a classic one. And then another one I did was so. Which, so which that, do you remember which song that was? Is that it was, one we would know? It was, it was even flow. Wow. All right, man. The reason, the reason I know for sure was collaborated because uh, there was an interview and I told one of my friends, oh my God, we did that song so many times, blah, blah, blah. And they showed me an interview with that Mike McCready had done. And I think it was a something 
a UK interview or something where they were asking him about making the record or whatever. And he said, Oh, by the time we were, we had done even flow so many times we wanted to kill each other or something like that. They were talking about how many takes of that that was. So I go, yep, that's the one. So, um, that was that one. And then I was, I was doing a, uh, another one that was, Oh God, I hate these kind of phone calls I had. So this is now pro tools then into the world, but we're still on SCSI drives. Oh yeah. Uh, right. It's a and, terrible uh, name for hard drives, by the way. <laughs> and um, this was in in Hollywood, and I was I was kind of freelancing at this point, and I was doing uh, the band Candlebox. The lead singer Kevin Martin uh, was doing a solo album. He he'd got a solo deal for a while, and I'd known him from Seattle and whatnot, and and I ended up doing uh, the record with him, and and all these demos, like just like a year worth of writing with him and putting, he was trying to find his thing. And, um, he had this really powerful manager at the time and all this, and it, it was going to SCSI drives and, but it was really early on in, in this stuff. And, um, the, uh, it, I didn't have him backed up and we had like, like, fail, you know, SCSI drives just bit it. And there wasn't really any, like, if you didn't know any, you had to know everything about that stuff. And with, especially with Pro Tools, or that was it. You couldn't really call somebody mm-hmm. and go, can you help me out on this? Everybody was still figuring it all out. Yeah. And no it, YouTube it, videos to, to yeah, Google. Yeah, no YouTube videos. And like, you know, you couldn't, like people were like, oh, well, I know this guy who, you know, works on computers and he knows. And I'm like, yeah, they're not going to understand. They're, you know, and you try to explain that to people and not going to understand. It's Pro Tools, da, 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 da. And, so they would try anyway. So we had this failure. So we didn't want, I, so Kevin comes in and I go, and I, first of all, I'm just telling people we got problems from it. I'll figure it out. It's going, you know, a day goes, but I, I can't figure it out. And then, so I have to tell Kevin and he's like, Oh man. And he's like, well, let's call this guy and that guy. We're in Hollywood. It's gotta be somebody. And a couple people came over. They c- couldn't do anything. They didn't know. And you're trying everything, just turn it on and off a bunch of times. I don't know. You know, it was like anything. Mm-hmm. So it finally came to that point where he's like, Kevin's like, dude, I got your back and everything, but this one, you got to make the call. So I had to call his manager who was, you know, like there's been a lot of money spent all this time, all these tracks and they were gone. Oh. It, was, it was over. And I had to survive. I had to, I paced up and down outside the studio before I like, made the call, got the guts to call, made the call to her. And, um, you know, I got screamed at and the whole bit, but, uh, we continued on and on, but boy, did I learn a lesson about backups and yeah, constantly. No, yeah. But, you know, nowadays everything's so stable. It's really, you know, but back then everything was so unstable. I remember the, you know, realizing the amount of time we sat waiting, watching and waiting for the computer to start up and restart to get Pro Tools to work and stuff back oh, in yeah. the day. I mean, like, and and that's all on studio time. I mean, we were talking about, yeah. like, you know, weeks lost to just watching the computer start. Oh, for sure. The early days of Pro Tools were, <clears throat> yeah. It was pretty chaotic. Well, um, what are some uh, tips that you got for people now about backing up stuff? How do you how do you like to do it the smart way? You know, I mean, it's so easy now. So it's like you just do it. You know, I just you know, you just make sure you have an extra drive there, and you just always. I'm just <clears throat> end of the night for sure. You know, always dragging stuff over. Yeah. It really is kind of a. I mean, I'm not going to say it's a thing of the past because it does happen. It can happen, but um, it is a lot easier now yeah. and. And so much easier just to drag and drop something over, but you know it's it's invaluable to do even even up to just you know maybe five years ago I you know once in a while I would still there could always be something weird or something and then if you're especially if you're uh, well it matters both if you're working with the label obviously it's very important and even if you're just your own running your own place um, <clears throat> you got multiple clients and stuff and people want things and and you, you know, it's just, I, you know, you you can't really be lazy about it. And it's easy to do, easy to be lazy unless you know, you're really one of those kind of people. But I always had to police myself on that and make sure. Yeah. Well, one of the things about the drag and drop method, so that's certainly the easiest way to back things up. Have two hard drives, 
drag it from your the one you've been working on all day over to the backup drive and just drop it on there and kind of paste over the what was there earlier. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, the the challenge or the, the mistakes that I've made in the past with doing it that way is um, a make sure that you're dragging from the master to the backup at the end of the night and you're bleary eyed and don't go backwards by accident. Don't go from the backup to the right. master and copy over what you just did. Um, and then B, the other mistake we made was um, we came into the studio and the backup drive was still connected. And the other producer I was working with, you know, he he went to go open the session. Well, he accidentally opened it from the backup drive and we were working on it all day, not realizing it. And then at the oh, end yeah, of the day, yeah. I jumped in to do the backup and I dragged from the master hard drive. I dragged the whole folder over to the backup, dropped it on there, pasted right over what was on the backup drive, thinking it was yesterday's work. When in fact, I had just deleted everything we did with the vocals that day, which was right. like, just sucked. <laughs> yeah. And then you got to think about that's that's a good one, too. And also to people working in different programs or older versions or, you know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. One of the things that I do remember um, noticing about when you make a genuine mistake in the studio and you have to do it over again I was really surprised to find that a lot of times the do-over is better than the one that you were so worried about losing <laughs> in the first place. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, you know, I just to keep the session, if that does happen, I just try, you know, with age, I've learned, I just don't get stressed on it. And if you deliver it right to the person, you're saying, look, man, we got to do that one again. Let's try again. I know you got a better one. Just keep that cool energy going on it and don't let it become a drag. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it just kind of happens naturally. Oh yeah. It's bet, you know, if you don't, you know, you don't put, don't, you know, put a light on it necessarily, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, thank you for sharing that story. That's awesome. I love hearing that, especially yeah, those, knowing those that, are the hor horrible ones. Those yeah. are like, you lose your career ones. Yeah, well, that was a <laughs> debut of the Pearl Jam edit story. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so another band that you work with, Alice and Janes, um, you know, a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. One is just listening to those guys again and, and on the song Wood, which I think was on the singles uh, motion picture soundtrack as well. Uh, the, the, set, the, the cool vocal, I always thought about it as a vocal effect and listening to it again, I'm like, it's just a smart parallel harmony going on that, that gives that kind of cool Alice and Chains sound. Um, I wonder if you want to talk about, you know, how to get that Alice in Chains vocal thing. And then also the drums, just this really big, um, beefy room sound on the drums. And I wonder if you could talk about getting big drum sounds like that, too. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's funny. Wood, uh, that was a funny one because they came in, um, I, we, there wasn't planned. I remember not seeing it on the... Um, calendar really or anything or no, rick didn't mention anything about it or the manager studio manager um and this is now they're they're more successful at this point they're pretty pretty much a you know pretty big thing and i remember like this truck showing up you know and i'm like holy cow who's this you know and and i realized that you know we have this you know alice is coming in I'm like oh okay you know i didn't know what it was for um I don't even know if they knew if it was for singles yet or not, or what it was very vague to what we were, why we were doing this. And, um, I remember it, uh, very well because, uh, Sean, they, they were, they had a crew that was loading in before the band even got there and stuff. Um, and you know, this was all getting new to us where everybody got big and famous, you know, at first, you know, like I said, they were all local. Just the, yeah. The dudes. other bands. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so, there's this brand new purple DW kit. And I go, wow, that's cool. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm still a musician guy. I'm like in awe, like, ah, oh, these guys are getting new gear, man. And uh, <laughs> so this, you know, this nice new kit comes in and we do our normal setup, you know, Rick setup. He, he, we always, the basic setup for all those records, whether it was Temple Dog, Pearl Jam, pretty much everything Rick did um, was like the London Bridge sound, room sound, drum sound was, um, there's a brick wall, one end of the studio, the drums go up there. It's like cement kind of uplifted floor with a brick curved wall. And then, um, so the drums go there and basically just boom, you got that whole big room they're facing. 
pounds of room and to get that sound. It was Rick would have us, he'd have me put, um, two eighty sevens, just this once, you know, we walked pre not all the way to the back of the wall of the other side of the room, but you know, at least, uh, three quarters of the way, you know, mm -hmm. and we just set them next to each other, you know, stereo pair of U 87s. And that it was, the room was so well designed and made. Um, you, you hit the drums in there. It just sounded awesome. That's just right. there you go. And then through the neat, you know, that great neat board that you got that line of the sound of those records. That was, that was really that. And then everything was, you know, typically closed mic, but you know, you had those two faders of that room. Um, that was it. And that made a lot of records, you know, that was that signature sound was really, that was, that was all there was to that, to that. Um, obviously he was, Rick was very particular about, you know, tuning and all that kind of stuff. And they were great players, but with Wood, they came in and, and another, another really straightforward setup. Rick really did his best work, like Temple of Dog and stuff like that, where it was, there was no, not much time, you know, where he, cause he was so particular and so good. It, it was better when he didn't have too much time, you know, he wouldn't over, right. overdo it. And, um, cause he'd feel like he had to cause he wasn't working hard enough or something. And I, he, everything when he's just right. I mean, he did it quick. It was great. It was yeah. just so, he was so on. So it was just a one day thing, man. They came in, they had this idea, they're running through it. Rick now had a really good relationship with producing those two guys. Cause he had been working with them since their demos before they were signed. Um, when they got signed, they ended up recording with Dave Jordan for the first record. Cause you know, label wanted, you know, a name producer and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but uh so rick knew knew them as up and coming like you know teenagers really uh and they were always playing with harmonies and rick could write harmonies all day long all the harmonies in the pro Jam record were written that way we sit at piano he'd sit at the piano with them pick out some notes and they by this point though it would they had been touring and doing this so they had their lane and jerry thing going on Mm -hmm. And it would be Rick in there just fine tuning it with him going, yeah, yeah you know, there, uh, that one. And, um, and it was all, like I said, it was done in a day and it was just that it was just straight and good. It was just good. No time to screw anything up. And it sounded, and they were on fire cause they'd been touring and they just nailed it. I know that feeling. I find a lot of times that my best work is done quickly too. Uh, sometimes I'm making everybody's head spin because I'm trying to keep the session moving so quickly <laughs> and I have to remember to slow down and just like chill out. Yeah. And and at this time too, they were comfortable there. You know, they've known it for a while. Um, you know, and they, they just had that magic then, you know? Yeah. Um, when you talked about the spaced pair of use 87s for the drum room, um, describe that a little bit more in detail. So somebody maybe has got a couple of mics and they're like, how far away is space? You know, what, what, which, well, which way do they point? Are they an Omni? Are they in cardio? All that kind of stuff. Right. No, we, we had them in cardio. Um, and you know, like two feet, we play with the distance from each other, you know, it could be, sometimes we did them really close, like right next to each other, you know, we're just the, the stands keeping them apart to, you know, a couple of feet away, uh, width wise. Um, but the room, I forget the, the, uh, measurements of the room, pretty large, studio room yeah. um and uh so you're getting a lot of room it, and, and not to mention they'd go through the boards compressors so you had a lot to play with with that um so by just you know that simple closed mic and stuff and then just sliding them that room to where you want it it just you know it was one of those studios that just sounded good and um that was that was really the london bridge <laughs> drum sound trick um, uh, that's cool. As I recall, wood is a it's a slower tempo too. And when yeah. you, when you have the slower tempos, like you hit a big snare, and it and it sort of sustains into the room a little longer, and and you have you have room for a big room sound. Sure. You know? And then you know when you're hearing the raw mixes coming back, like off the monitor section. I mean, there's still we play with where they sat all the time. And then by the time it's mixed, you know, there's different processing going on too, but whoever's mixing it, whether it was us or an, another mixer, you know, those London bridge rooms were always there to be put in or, or not as you, as you wanted it. But, and that was the time then too, where, you know, those room sounds were part of that 
ended up becoming a signature sound of that era, you know? Um, so t- tell us a little bit about the studio you're in now and, and um, what kind of projects you're working on. Are you still finding that you really, I know you're doing electronic music as well. Are you still enjoying um, sort of bringing a band into the studio and capturing that? And how are you combining these two different interests? Yeah, well, um, well, the, the electronic stuff I've actually been doing for a long, long time. Just I, when I used, to, let me just tell you this real quick. Like when I used to um, skip, I'd skip school when I like playing guitar, like back in the in the heavy metal days. And I nice. would, uh, yeah, I skip school because I made there was a there was a music store right like right by the the high school, and um, I met you know knew the guitar teacher there, so I'd skip uh, class and go over there and hang out with him and play guitars. Well, they had a Roland S10 sampler in there. I didn't know what they were for, whatever. I didn't know, but I just mess around. I go, what, what is, you know, what is this thing? And I got totally intrigued by it. So I ended up getting one. So I had this sampler sitting around through all these times, never hardly used it. I didn't know what I would ever use it for, <laughs> you know, but I always thought, man, it'd be so cool. What if I sampled a guitar? Like, and I could play it. And I would do that stuff just for pure, just messing around, just whatever, just making stupid noises and stuff. Um, and so I, I'd already discovered that. And so after, uh, you know, a number of years, probably like in, oh, almost late nineties or something, I started going back into, you know, there was all the chemical brothers and everything like that yeah. was coming out. And I was getting really intrigued with that and <clears throat> kind of so burnt out and doing so much guitar music. And this was sounding intriguing to me and cool. And I just started, and, and I was also like, started doing some soundtrack work for the, I signed a publishing deal when I had, when I was on Island and, um, I started getting a little bit of work with that. And I, I remember saying the, the publisher guy said, what do you need? Uh, I can get you, you know, I actually ended up doing some stuff for virtuosity with Denzel Washington. And I said, I need a sampler. And they go, and it was so, first of all, I was amazed. I got a posting deal and then I could ask for them to buy me something. <laughs> so I said, I need a sampler. That's what I need. I'm going to do a movie. I need a sampler. So I got this new Curseful K2000 sampler. And then nice. I just started, I got back into it. Um, and so recently, and so I've always dabbled in and always been doing that. And, um, so recently, uh, you know, last few years, I, uh, you know, wasn't doing as much band stuff. I'm working in, in studios, trying to figure out what I'm doing next. And I just spent a lot of time getting back into that and really getting into programming and, um, and, and synthesizers. And just, it was a great way to keep my creativity going and expressing myself. So that's where that all comes from. And so that's why I started doing that as far as, and what's great now, the position I'm in now, um, it wasn't a plan at all to, uh, start working at a studio in Pittsburgh. I had moved out here from Seattle due to family situations and wife's from here mm-hmm. and, um, thought, you know, it was time for a move. I don't know what I'm going to do there. I don't, I don't know if they've got a scene. I, you know, started Googling, you know, looking on it. I don't know what they got there. Maybe I'll, maybe I can get some work out in New York or some, I, I didn't even know. I was just ready for a new, you know, we'll see what happens yeah. kind of thing. And the universe was working for me. And I got here and, uh, met and ran into, uh, Mike Speranza and Liz Berlin, who Liz is from the band Rusted Root, um, who had a lot of success in the nineties. So we kind of hit it off in that way. And we were actually, we're on the same label and we didn't even know. It's like funny stuff. And we all related to things. And Mike had just, they run uh, Mr. Smalls here, which is like the big concert theater here. Mm-hmm. All the touring bands go through and they, they had this other place that a church and they didn't know what they wanted to do with it. They were thinking a restaurant or something. He just said, I want to, I want my own, I want a nice real old school studio for me. I don't care if, we ever book it or what, you know, that was his thinking. And I came into it and he goes, Hey, I want to show you something. And he had just got this Trident TSM 40 input board. And I walk nice. in, I go, and he didn't tell me. And I walk in this church and I see, I go, dude, <laughs> wow, man, this is cool. What do you got going here? What are you doing? And so my wheels start turning, you know, and I did not think I, I was like, well, I'm out of studio business. I'm never doing that again. You know, <laughs> and, uh, 
And here I am. Well, you know, I can't help myself now. And so I, I started talking to him about it and he, they were intrigued you know, with my history. And, and I called my, my friend who, who was the owner, Rick and Raj Parasha were the owners of London Bridge. And I knew that they had, uh, Rick had passed away a few years ago, but Raj had, um, uh, I knew he owned the tape machine still. He sold the studio to two of the guys that worked at employees. So they it kept it in the family, which is great. But I knew he had the studio because he was transferring tapes for Temple of Dogs. They still had the masters. They were going through different uh, legal issues about getting the re- for a re-release, all these kinds of things. So I knew he had it, but I knew he wasn't doing anything with it and was sitting. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to call him and may- maybe he'll sell it to me, you know? And, uh, so long story short, it turned out great. He said, you know, I, I called him and asked him and he said, I talked to my, my parents and everything. And we decided, you know, was it just sitting here? You know, we think Rick would want you to have it. And um, so it just blew me away. It was wow. just like amazing. So I had it shipped out here and we refurbished it. And that was like my first contribution to the studio. I said, look, I'll put this, how about I put this machine here? And they were blown away by that. They're like, yeah, it's got so much history. And, and then the ball just started rolling and we, uh, we all started turning with both of us and we just started say, let's just do this. And so, um, and see what, what comes of it. Like we weren't, you know, no pre, you know, weren't trying to necessarily, we didn't know what the outcome would be. And we had turned up really just making like a real, like the old, you know, we have a great big pro tools rig, but we wanted to go old schools. We have a big console like that. So we ended up, you know, refurbishing the studio that we had all this history from Pearl Jam and Alice had changed and screaming trees and everybody in between mother love all the, all the bands that recorded on it. And then we had got another machine. So we have two studios that match and we actually got a, uh, one inch, uh, C 37 studer tube that we came across that actually was only been, it was modified and used like Rick Rubin rented it for a year. Nice. They did, they did Michael Jackson to it, like real specialty records would use it. One of them happened to be the Rusted Root record. So Liz had history with it. So we ended up investing in that. So we are this very tape centric studio and we thought, why not, man, let's just go for it. And so we were doing that. So we are like, we're as tape as you can get. And, but we're all mingled with the, uh, you know, Pro Tools obviously with this big giant church room. So we're able to do, um, those kind of records that I, that I used to do in the, in those big type of studios. So it's, uh, and it's been long enough now that, uh, I think, you know, it's come full circle. Like people want to do that again. And we've, so we've got, uh, there's like two new rock acts that, and that we're going to be doing here within the next few months. And, um, you know, we're going to do it that old school way. And, um, that's cool. That's exciting. Yeah. And what yeah. a great story about the tape machine too. Have you, I know, um, it's unbelievable. Everything went full circle. Have you, uh, wh- are, where do you keep track of your sort of, um, pedigree of the tape machine? You know, this history of, of who's recorded on it and everything. Do you have a, a way to, does it, does, is there a plaque next to it or something? You know, like that? Well, it's funny. We just, that's funny. You said it. So the remote, remote control, you know, half of it has just a, uh, like a steel plate in case you had two controllers in there. Um, so what we did is we took that out and had it engraved with a bunch of the major records that were oh, cool, done on cool. it. So yeah, you know, we wanted to make a special, especially since, you know, Rick and the family gave it, you know, I inherited it. We wanted to keep that history alive and it's cool for people here, especially in Pittsburgh or anybody who visits here, because it means, you know, it it's, in Seattle, it's one thing, but when it's outside of Seattle, you know, it, it has a, even more of an effect because I think people are a little numb to it all there. Um, so, you know, it's one of, it's, it's got, it's got mojo, you know? Well, so, you know, we've become an important historians for, for this stuff. Right. You know, it was better than it was just sitting at his, in his house doing nothing. So he wanted to see it working again and he's excited to fly out and see it, everything when it's in, in action, you know, it keeps the legacy alive.
This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSonus Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Uh, let me ask you this question. So here you are, you're, you're about to record in a studio that does have a big, big, big space because a big church. Um, what advice do you have for the rock stars about when you're, when you do find yourself recording in a space and maybe the space is too big? How, how do you, you know, you talked about gobos before, but what should people know about how to actually manipulate the sound of the space that you're going to track a band in? Well, yeah, that's great. I learned that lesson through that time period. When, and I'll, I'll tell you what you do is um, you just change rooms. Is what we would, You mix things up. Uh, when during the era, during that, that 90s era, where we were doing a lot of big records, um, Blind Melon came in. They, they wanted nothing to do with a big room drum sound they were yeah. like nothing to do with that so it threw us off for a minute we're like oh all right so what we did was put we had a pretty you know good size room that we used for guitars we, you could use it for anything piano we could roll the piano in there if we wanted to but it was you know uh, a deader smaller overdub room and we just okay let's just put the drums in there and forget the room mics and that's what we did and that record has a completely different sound yet it was recorded in that that same studio. So like here we did luckily the, the way the studio sign we have two you large enough control or um um overdub rooms that you can fit a drum kit in. Um and so we we put in, you know, enough panels um to where that it, you know, so if we want, there's, you know, there's 16 mic inputs or whatever you need in those different rooms. So if you wanted to or you wanted to just have um, a kit in the lar in the big room, and then you have a kit in the uh, uh, another like just you know four piece or whatever five piece kit in the um, room with a different sound. You could do that too and jump around. And then if if you don't have that option, you know, don't put up any room mics. I, I know my own my own place. I was when I first sold my own. I was kind of I didn't have a big room, um, and I was man, how am I going to do? How am I going to recreate what people, you know, might think I'm that what they might be coming for yeah. from me. And, um, I just got over it quick. I was really nervous, you know, first few sessions and I just, you know, I just started using, uh, I just wouldn't do a room or if I would, and lots of times I wouldn't use it. I just wouldn't use a room and then I'd manipulate, you know, I'd use an effect or a reverb or something. And, you know, that worked too, you know? So it, and sometimes I, I, you know, I did a session at, uh, electric lady and C and they, the room was kind of weird sounding, it had this weird ceiling. And mm -hmm. even though I mean, this amazing studio, it's electric lady. You're, you're like, I'm yeah. so psyched. And I just said, man, I'm not even going to use the rooms. Now their room, their, their a room, I would say I would have mics up that immediately, <laughs> but this particular room, the C room just didn't had a weird thing to it. And so we just, you know, you just don't. So it depends. Like if you, if you don't have a good sounding room, don't mic it. No, right. it good sound point. right. Don't mic it. Good point. But uh, it's cool to hear you remind us that, like, you know, you may have a room that you think is your studio, but there might be some other rooms around it that you didn't think was your studio, but you should try them all, you know, listen to the sound of stuff in different rooms. While you were telling me that story, I'm I'm thinking about my little kitchen ISO booth where the headphone mixer got ripped off the shelf yeah. twice by people walking through. And all of a sudden, you know, call it dumb, but I was like, man, I got to try doing some drums in there. You can't barely even fit a kick drum in that space, but it might sound super cool for just the right thing. 
Yeah. Um, on the Afghan Wigs record, we tracked that in in New Orleans at Daniel Lawaz's place, and we used a oh, kit. King, Kingsway was that it? Kingsway, yeah. yeah. We we had a kit. We tra- we put a kit in every because it wasn't really laid out as a studio. It was laid out as a house, and we just like had a kit. We had a little kit everywhere and anywhere, like and just put a couple of Coles mics on it and fifty seven on the snare. Like it wasn't elaborate at all. And they always sounded cool. Or at, you know, one thing I was going to say to you, you mentioned the bathroom. So I was uh, uh, at Le- at Electric Lady, since I wasn't using the room, um, and there was all these great producers hanging around. Eddie Kramer was working there when I was there. And I was like, nice. oh, my God, this is so cool, you know. And uh, um, so one of the guys says, oh, have you tried the... Uh, somehow in the lobby or something I was talking about, yeah, you know, the room's kind of funky up there. You go, oh, did you try the door open? I go, no, why? He goes, oh, that's a, that's a, a secret. Se- secret sauce for room, Studio C. And I go, really? So there's this door that I'm like, I got to try it. And somebody said, you know, instant Bonham or something, John Bonham. I'm like, okay, where, what is this all about? So it was a door that led up to the roof. There's just this hallway that, like our stairwell, ah. led up to the roof. Studio C that didn't know. And um, so I immediately had to try that. And I was using a sampler a lot on that particular thing. And I would sa- I'd have the guy play a loop and I, so I was sampling it, but I had a mic out in that hall and it was amazing. And funny enough, my conference, so the later in the day or whatever, taking a break and I'm down in one of the main areas that there's three three studios there and who's out there with Eddie Kramer. I knew who he was, but you know, hadn't been introduced yet. And he, and he says to me, ah, I see you heard about the secret door. <laughs> and that's how we started our conversation. Go, oh yeah. Cause he could hear, you know, if he had the door open up there, it would, he could hear it if you were out in the other rooms apparently or something. And I go, yeah, it's amazing. Goes, yeah. That's the old CDC trick. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. So that was my introduction to be able to speak to him. But yeah, you do things like that. So like, you know, a lot, you know, that's a trick that I'm sure a lot of home guys do, like put a room in the bathroom and yeah. keep the door open or in the garage or whatever. Yeah. Um, I was God, a dentist that I go to actually moved into this building downtown with really, really tall, you know, like I got to go up to the 11th floor and I took the stairs back down just because I remember reading, you know, somebody mentioned like, you want to stay healthy? Just take the stairs. I was like, all right, I'll take, a, yeah. take 11 flights of stairs down. But going in the the stairwell too, I'm whistling and it's just like, oh my God, it sounds incredible in there. I want to, I, I kind of look forward to doing a record where we just, I take a little portable recorder around and just go to to unusual spaces. Maybe I'll do an iPhone record like that at some point. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Sylvia is always, she's always doing that kind of, Crazy right, stuff. Right, Sylvia Massey. Yeah, she's always doing stuff in crazy places and getting all the, the I, I sounds. saw the video with the pickle filter where they were like running a... Yeah, there's one where she's in some, uh, I don't know what, some crazy outdoor building that's half deconstructed or cement thing and they're like recording. It. It's like huge sounding and so, yeah, she does all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, all right, cool. Well, let's jump into some of our um, outro questions here. Or actually, before we do that, let me let you talk a little bit more about doing electronic stuff. So you've been doing this for a long time. What are, what are your thoughts about using the computer versus using hardware tools to make electronic music? Any Anything you want to go into there about like yeah, actually, know, how that works for you? Sure. Um, well, okay. So the, the first time I, I made a the first record I did, that's the one I re-released. I um, did that in 90, like eight or something like that. Okay. Cool. Something like that. Um, and I didn't, or maybe it was even earlier than that, but um, I, I only had, and I, I was doing this on my own, like outside, no studio time or nothing. And I had like an ADAT and uh, that Kurzweil sampler that I spoke of, uh, like an HR 16 drum machine and a turntable, oh, yeah. basically. I wasn't using Pro Tools really or anything. Um, and I did all that by like just sampling stuff and um, manipulating stuff off turntable. It's the old school way of doing it. And I w- so, you know, when I pulled that back out after a bunch of years and I started writing again, I thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a new one of those 
this many years later and, you know, revisit it, you know? And so now, so I get, I get into it and I've been collecting different things and I have these different programs, you know, Ableton and Reason and of course Pro Tools and has a bunch of right. hardware stuff and all these goodies, plugins and soft sense that I didn't have back then. And I couldn't get started for the long, I mean, it took me a year really to get started. Like, and I was like, how was I making that stuff? I mean, it would be so difficult, like so easy to do what I was doing back then. All, all the cuts and the drops and everything I had yeah. in there in Pro Tools now. And I, I was really frustrated because I couldn't even get started. I'd get a loop going and like, that was it. And like, couldn't add to it. And I, I, I just kept, what? and I still wonder like, man, my creativity was so more driven and um, by my limitations then, mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't know. So I really had to learn how with all these tools, you think I'd be so much more creative as so many things, but it's like, it was way harder. It still is for me to uh, get ideas done and get them out. Um, how do you limit your creativity now? Have you, have you learned anything <laughs> about your own process? Yeah. I mean, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, it's still a process. I'm, I'm now like trying to limit, like I'm trying to just go, okay, dude, what is working? What isn't just way too many options. You're just going to keep making sounds. And what I've done now is kind of got limiting myself to like, I'll work a little bit in reason or in Ableton. And then, and I, I kind of got this tip off of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the producer ill mine. No, uh, not yet, but we are now. Yeah. He, he, uh, he, he's doing a lot. And I just want a Grammy for working on Jay Z or the Carlington. Oh, Car cool. Yeah. Um, but he, he does a lot of YouTube uh, things and, and <clears throat> workshops and stuff. And he had mentioned, and surprisingly, he, I mean, all his stuff is like beat making stuff, but he's kind of old school and he works in Pro Tools, which is unusual for a lot of the guys today doing that. They're ma mainly in loop-based programs. And he purposely doesn't because he says you get stuck in that. And like with Pro Tools, I mean, yeah, they're more MIDI oriented now, but if you don't think about it in that way, think about how we all kind of use Pro Tools. It makes you more think about song structure and working in that sense. So you're not, you don't get stuck in this loop. Right. You can cycle. be a little more creative or something. Yeah, it forces you to like cut and paste and move things around a different way. It just makes you work a different way. So now I'll come up with some some cool ideas or whatever in one of the two program, MIDI type programs, loop programs. And then I'll just start moving ideas over into Pro Tools because it, if I'm in the other programs, there's so many different synthesizers, different things I can pull up or, or vice versa, or I'll take some hardware things, sequences or things I'm doing and just record them straight into Pro Tools and let them build up over a bit and then start piecing things together that way. And it right. starts forcing me more to put it together in more of a song or at least a movement of some sort, as opposed to just hearing the same loop over and over with adding layers and taking away layers, which is what you hear mostly on on a hip hop or, or R and B track these days on the radio, you'll hear it's basically the same loop with a, you know, a mute button here and there. Right. Right. Well, you know, hearing you talk about the infinite possibility of choices in the computer and with all the plugins and stuff. And I mean, you know, I pull up my plugin list and it's just this long, long list of stuff. And, um, but again, also you talking about Rick working quickly, I'm just reminded of this idea that like sometimes just making myself work and make decisions quickly and then not giving myself a bunch of time to go back and like, well, what if I adjust that? Well, could, is this really the best choice? Maybe I should try these other compressors and see how they sound. And I, I could almost see like a creative process where now you take advantage of the commit feature in Pro Tools and at the end of every day, you just commit yeah, all the it, tracks so like every day when you come back to this song you can't go you can't untweak that plugin anymore it's just like on tape yeah and then it becomes a character of the song or whatever and, and you, you just got especially with writing and especially in that kind of music you gotta just uh, i mean i found you just have to or else you just it'll take forever you just get stuck yeah and um and then you just leave it and then you work on another thing you come back to it oh yeah that was cool and then you get a whole new idea and you start piecing it together so that's what's made me move forward on that and the same with like you know, I've learned too, like with, if you're just loaded up in all your plugins, now I'll like stick to the one, you know, I know these ones work, man. And I, 
and I know my what I basically use them for. And I get really close to everything. And then if there's one that I've always wanted to try, or I'll, or there's um, I'm getting I'm pretty much there. But there's some things I want to add to it now. I want to make it different. I want to tweak something. I want to get some new flair to it. Then I'll experiment. I'll go through a couple of new ones I haven't really used and see if they work or not. If they don't, I just ditch them. Yeah. And but then you stumble across something sometimes, and I'm like cool. And I'm not afraid to print plugins either. Like if it's early on, if I've got a thing going with it. I'll print them, you know. Yeah, well, now it's like, again, if you're in Pro Tools, you just commit the track. And, I mean, you can do that in all the DAWs. You just bounce the track down so that it's no longer a plugin with, uh, or no longer is a track with a plugin on it. It's just a sound that was printed. You right. Know? And if I'm doing my own stuff, I mean, if you're working for a producer or something, you got to be a little bit careful because you don't know who it's going <laughs> to. If you're working for a label, it's a different, I mean, seriously, if you're hired as an engineer, that's your job. Uh, you got to make sure if it's, you know, you, I don't you know. become the plug-in. Yeah. And you got to make sure that you don't know who's going to get this at the end of the day, mixing it or whatever. So you, you've got to be, you know, you got to kind of know, you got to let that, you don't want somebody coming back later. Like, why did this guy, you know, That's print the, this, you the know, worst delay ever. Yeah. Yeah. Or this compressed too much, you know, on my own stuff, like even hardware going to tape, there's certain compression things I do that are kind of over the top. I'll print them, but it's me. I know it, you know? Um, and yeah. I don't like, I, I'm used to it or I, I know what I'm going for. So I'm not worried about it as much, but uh, so it depends, but like on my own stuff, I'll, or if I'm producing it, I don't, I, there's some things I'll double compress and I'll, and like, you want to wait for it? Do it later. I'm like, no, do it. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, um, yeah, I have, or, a lot of times I'll have guitar players ask me, it's like, well, should I, do you want my guitar dry? And then you can add the, I'm like, no, that, no, hell no. You got a yeah, thing, is it any good? Then let's print it. Yeah, I'm totally like that with guitar players. I know with the, when I'm lucky enough to have an engineer for me, if I'm just producing, um, if I haven't really worked with them before, it's, it'll be funny because I'll have them go through this. It, well, depending on what the studio is, if there's a studio with a ton of cool outboard gear, I want to use it, you know, yeah. I want to hear all of it. And so, you know, nerd, I'll go, man, run it through that, that, and that. And, she, and they're like, really? Are you sure? And I go, yeah, just do it. And, um, and you know, we can always turn them, you know, turn them off. We'll just run through. And, and if I like them, I'll go, yeah, just keep, you know, if she want me back or, or they'll really be soft and everything. I go hit that a little harder and I go for it. And they're, they're always timid because they're doing their job. They're trying to make sure they're not printing something I don't want, but I'm like, I find that funny with guys that I just work with. They're like, you know, barely touching the needle right, right. compression or anything. I'm like, man, it sounds cool when you do that. I love it. Hit it. And so I, but, you know, I've, I've benefited from having producers come in and push me like that too. There was a um, producer and he heard, he, you know, he asked somebody else how they got the, a certain sound and it involved taking the input of the 1176 and jacking it all the way up. And I was like, okay, so we try it out. It sounds amazing. I immediately use that same trick on the next record I'm producing myself. And it becomes like my favorite vocal sound I've gotten in a long time. You know, just right. totally misusing the knobs. And that that's one of the advice that I have for um, interns that I'm working with and people who are just starting out with this stuff is like, a lot of times people, they're wondering, what does the compressor do? And then t you take a knob and you... You, you tweak it a little bit this way and a little bit that way. And you're like, I, I can't really, I don't know if I hear what it's, it's like, of course you don't hear what's going on. Turn it all the way up and then turn it all the way down and then see if you hear it. And then, yeah, it, and then yeah. go for a little bits after that, you know? I, I do that totally. And I, I learned that too. I, there was a Bruce I worked with a lot, Kelly Gray, who's done a, a lot of great records, but he's one of the guys, man, he just, he'll just start cranking stuff to hear what everything does. And then he, then he pulls it all back. Right now I know what it does. And I was like, Oh man, you know, duh, that makes sense. Yeah. Take the shortcut, um, you know, just like, don't be, you know, you gotta be fearless with it. You know, I, I was always, you know, at first you're a little timid. I remember being, used to being so afraid of the patch bay when I first oh, started working for Rick, you know, I was like, Oh God. And if I didn't do it quick enough, he's going to think I'm stupid. You know, you you start, you know, when you're young and you're first doing it, man, and you get a big gig, it's like, you get so that's why I wrapped in your head. That's why I didn't smoke pot in the studio. Oh, yeah. First be... first time looking at a patch base stoned, and I was done for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know. But, yeah, you know, you got to do that. You got to be a little bit fearless and know what they do. And even sometimes, like, you know, it, it doesn't always work, but I there was an 1178, the stereo 
version. And for some reason, something about it sounded really good, even if, you know, I wasn't really compressing anything. And I just found that out because like by accident, I had it patched in or something by accident. I took it out or something. Why does it sound different? You know, a snare or something and put it back in and I, I'm not even hitting it. I'm not even like yeah. doing anything with it. But some for some reason, this particular one, because I tried in other places it might have them and uh, that didn't seem to do anything. Maybe it was just in my head. I don't know. But every time I used that, I would start just running something through it. Just just on by, you know, nothing. And that particular unit had some kind of thing to it. So, I mean, you just never know. There's yeah. all those variables. Yeah, I remember listening to Jakir King, uh, who's going to come on the show um, in a little bit here, hopefully. Um, I was supposed to do it in April anyway. Uh, he, he was telling a story about doing, uh, checking the phase on a microphone and he pointed out that it sounds different if you phase flip the mic pre or if you flip the mic on the way into the mic pre or if you flip it after the mic pre on the way into Pro Tools. And I was struck by that. It's just like, wow, you know, just even where you decide to flip the phase of something can make it sound different. Yeah, well, one of my favorite tools um, that I think, yeah, even had a, one of my favorite things to bring, I'll bring this with me in my bag, is um, a variable phase. So you you know oh, radio like the, makes uh, little them. labs. Yeah, they make them right, and I love having one of those because especially because I'll do a lot of multiple mic stuff and guitars and whatnot. I mean, I'm always checking phase, but with you doing like a guitar or something, or you know different instruments where you're doing that, having a variable phase is so great when you can just dial that phase and it's mm -hmm. not all the way. You know, it's in between sometimes, and you get a whole different. You know, it's not just flipping it 180. Like if you can get it somewhere, sometimes there's those magic spots that, I mean, it's such a valuable tool. And then with like, you know, with plugins and hard versus hardware, the, you know, I might love and use a hardware piece of gear one way. And, you know, I I I don't use, you know, that plugin, like the plugin version and hardware version are two different things to me completely. I use, I don't even think of plugins the same way I think of the hardware. Mm -hmm. I find what plugins I like and I think of them as a whole different effect. They have a whole different thing to them. No matter how well they're modeled, um, they're just they're just a different animal, um, you know. So, you know, yeah. I, just, I just they're like a whole different thing to me. They're a different effect than whatever the hardware version is. Well, they're, I, I'm they're with cool. you. On that. They're cool. They're just as cool. They're just different. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that. I was just going to say that. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yet at the same time, when you're first learning this stuff, you know, if you read about a a hardware unit doing something and then you get a hold of the plugin, sure, go try it out with the plugin. You you might get like, you know, 80% of the way towards uh, I, that sound, you know. I think that's one of the great, you know, in that sense, I can agree more. Like I wish like there was something like that. It would have eased my fear like the first time I sat in front of an SSL or a Neve. You know, and like going, wow, how do I cue something on this? Having like, you know, basically a simulator in front of you to do it before you ever got into the right. studio. Right. Huge tool. What an advantage. I'll do that now if I'm working in a place or or something that I haven't worked on before and there's a plugin for it. I'll check it out first before I get to that place or whatever. Okay, oh, okay I see. And then, you know, you're not as um, you're just a little more familiar with it before you get using the real thing. Very cool. Um, well, let me jump into some of our last questions here, and, and we'll kind of uh, close out the show. Um, the first one is, um, when you started out with all this stuff, you know, you're talking about wishing you had a plug-in before the hardware, uh, but what what do you feel like was one of the things when you started out in recording that was holding you back? Uh, kind of like what I was talking about, just uh, intimidation, kind of fear. There was, there was like, um, you know, being like what I was telling you in my early days, just going in as, as a musician, you know, there was the engineers and stuff. They'd like to kind of keep you away from like, they had a secret. They knew this secret mm. skill that you don't, and you were at their mercy. Um, and that's really what pushed me into learning what is like, I, I got to start doing this because, you know, I, I got to know what they're holding back from me. Um, and then being dissatisfied with things and I going, no, there's a way I know there's sounds out there cause I'm hearing them on records, you know, but you know, that was, I, and I was lucky, you know, getting those first major label type projects, even though they weren't even big bands yet, but the, the fact that 
Rick just threw me in the fire. It was like he gave, I remember hoping he was going to coach me through it a little bit more and like show me stuff. And I remember asking like, you know, cause I'd never worked, I'd never, you know, an EVQ, I had no idea. And, um, and I had brought in demos I had done on different things, everything from four tracks to wherever I work, could get my hands on stuff. And he, he didn't even want to hear him, never listened to him. And, um, it just, uh, threw me into it. And so one day he goes, here's what you need. And he handed me a physics book, like from the university of Washington, where he went to college, a hardback physics books, which I still have on my bookshelf. That's correct. Like, well, this is during, uh, he was mixing temple of the dog and he handed it to me, he goes, go study this. And I'm like, what? I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> what a dick, man. Like, <laughs> this is like school. Like, I'm not going to re- what does this have to do with getting good sounds? You know, I'm like, I have no idea. And so there's always this thing. And then, you know, once I'd get nights alone or, Hey, if there's downtime, why don't you get one of your friend's bands there? If there's a band you want to do, you know, let them come in and start doing it. You know, when I got to really, but, but even, even when we did the records before I even did that, he just threw me in. He said, you know, start learning, man, start doing it. And I was scared shitless, you know? Um, You know, it's funny. I, I, try to encourage uh, interns that I work with to do that. And I'm always surprised at um, how rare it is sometimes these days to find somebody who wants to take advantage of the studio to do that. Um, and I remember when I was, you know, starting out, I was just like, man, it was all, I just wanted to be in there all the time. I was thrilled to be, I'd be like, hey, can, can we go record an overdub this weekend? You know? Sure. I know. Yeah, you'll see, and you'll, I'll see like interns and different people. And students, they're like, they're scared. I mean, they are afraid to touch anything or do stuff. Some aren't, you know, but some are. And I, I kind of remember being right in the middle, like, eh, I, you know, wanted to go for it because no way I wasn't, but, you know, I was really nervous. But, yeah. you know, you work through that. But, you know, mentioning that there's people not taking advantage of it. Um, we were having, we were in New York getting the studios work on up at the, where Sears Sound is in, in New York. Yeah. And we were asking, Dan is his name. He's older guy. Who's, he's the last master of fixing studio tape machines. Cause you know, these techs are a dying breed literally. Um, and, and, uh, we were asking like, so do you have like, you know, some students, interns that you're passing this on to? Cause it's hard to find somebody who fix this studio tape machine or, or any of these classic pieces of equipment. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, you'd be surprised I have, I'll get somebody in the last few weeks and then they're just not interested. And it's like amazing. I'm thinking, Oh my God, what if I was young and to have that kind of thing passed on? Cause you're always going to have a job. You're, you're always going to be sought right. after because you're one of the only people on the planet who knows how to fix the things. But, um, yeah, yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah. It's just like people are interested in different things now. I don't, I don't know. Well, you know, it may also be the fact that, um, most people starting out in this, they've got a computer with all the plugins and they're, they're sort of thinking that's where it's at, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it makes sense to, you know, learn how to program, learn how to write code. I don't know, you know? Um, so uh, can you share with us a recording tip, hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars could use on their next session today? Um, secret sauce. I, I don't know. Not anything in particular. I'm always looking for secret sauce. I just try, <laughs> you know, literally like I just, there's not a session or if I switch in, we're okay. We're going to move on to bass or guitars or whatever. I'm trying something there's and I might not use it, but there's one track going down somewhere or an extra, you know, there's parallel enough, track. Like an unusual thing I'll happening. find something, man, just something. And, you either hit or miss and you just don't worry about it if it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my secret sauce. It could be anything. I mean, it really could. Um, well, it's a good tip. I remember uh, working with Steve Albini and we were talking about the same kind of idea. And he said he try he likes to try something new and different on every session, you know, one new thing. But part of the advice too was that, wasn't that like, Hey, try something new. It was also like what you said a moment ago, Dave, which is, you know, stick to the stuff that you know that works and then also try something new. Well, you know what else happens? It's like reverse engineering a little bit too. Uh, I'll try, I always try, you know, throw a different mic positioning thing or an odd mic in a weird room. And, you know, time after time I'll go, you know, 
those all sucked. <laughs> you know, right. the way I, the way I do it there, those, those work. And then, then you, that's how, you know, what works. So you're like, okay, you know what? That is a, that's a solid way that that's always works for me. Um, you know, so you can work, learn either way. And then sometimes you stumble across stuff. I do a lot of it with guitars and things like that. And that's, what's fun too, with, uh, doing electronic stuff and keyboards and synthesizers, it's all just turning knobs and experimenting and, and, no, there's really no wrong or rights. And so I yeah. just always carry that over to, uh, to that. And even with vocals too, you know, I love to do different things with vocals or I'll, I'll if I'm producing, I'll push vocalists to try different tracks of different stuff. And they'll go, I, I don't really get it. I go, well, let's just try it. I have an idea. And then I just leave it in there, leave it at different comps and mute them for a long time. And then if I'm mixing or later on, I might throw a cool effect or, something on them or, or cut them up and move them to different places and bring it in. And I'll, they'll go, what's that? And I go, that was one of those takes you did. And, you know, so yeah, I always do little things like that. You just yeah. got to kind of make your own special sauce. Well, very cool. Well, let me, let me take you to our final closeout question too. Um, this one's hypothetical, but um, you know, you're going to go back and take the Wayback studio machine and uh, find <laughs> young Dave with his, you know, learning his heavy metal licks on guitar in Seattle. And you say, listen, Dave, here's this one bit of advice I want to give you. Here's the single most important thing you need to know if you want to become a rock star of the recording studio one day. What, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Uh, you know, be fearless. Um, be original. Like, find, you know, your... I mean, I think this is what eventually helped me. So like if I would have known this from the beginning, uh, you know, pay attention to details and really be original yeah. and, and just commit, and know it, you know, and, um, you know, that, that's it. Just have that confidence and, and, you know, do your homework, but also, you, you know, don't be afraid to learn right there on the spot and just keep doing it. You know, yeah. that was my thing. Once I got over the fear of stuff and got, you know, and, and, and if you're an assistant, here's, here's a tip. If assistant, man, be the best assistant you can be like, have, like get it down so good that they don't even know you're there. And then that's when you really, then, you know, you can run the room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you may, you make a good point. Be detail oriented. It's like, if you're not really ready to get everybody's lunch order, just right. Um, you, you might not be ready to run the whole session for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, and like, I always like to just try to be one step ahead of the producer or whatever. Like, I'm not waiting for him to ask something. I'm already, and because I had experience uh, being in bands recording, so you kind of know, like, I know they're going to, you know, that headphone set over there better be ready pretty soon because they're going to move to that. Or I should start running cable over to there mm -hmm. before that, you know, just kind of, you know, or if I'm working a patch bay or if I'm working a Pro Tools, if I'm, uh, you know, tape hopping to whatever degree, you know, I've got some other tracks ready to roll. So I just pop into them. just things like that. I'll always be a little bit ahead so that the um, producer's not even thinking about it. And he'll, he'll love that. And that's what gets you moving. And that's what makes you valuable in the studio. And, you know, it's so hard to even get a gig in a studio and anything these days. Those are what's going to separate. Those things are what's going to separate you from whatever and be, and then if the opportunity comes up, like, wow, you know, this guy canceled or, or, you know, you don't even know how you're going to get your next game. And some, there's a band, I don't know, we need to record and you don't think you're ready. I can do it. Just say it, go yeah. for it. Nice. I mean, I didn't realize when I started out in recording that the ability to hear in the distance, somebody make a comment and then for you to make a sharp pencil and a piece of paper appear on their music stand yeah. was like a valuable skill of engineering. Total, that, couldn't just said it better. That's totally it. And you know what? Be likable, man. I'll take getting a producer job. Like if they're, it's, if you're an engineer or you're a guy working in the studio and the band likes you, you know, you yep. could get, you could get asked to do the next record. You could ask the engineer or when they come back to track some new songs, all of a sudden that, you know, well, let's have him do it. And that happens all the time. Yeah, you spend a lot of time in the studio together. So um, peop if they don't like you, you're going to be was, the first thing to go. <laughs> if they vibe off you, you know, I, my friend, uh, Gordon Raphael, producer who did the strokes, that was what he told me that was all about. They liked me. Like we got along 
and we made a record, you know? That's great. Well, Dave, thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, man. Yeah, what thank a, what you a for pleasure to hang out with you and get to talk to you about your world. Um, let the Rockstars know how they can find you online and follow you and listen to your music and check out your new record. Yeah, it's easy. Dave Hillis Music dot com. Okay, cool. And, uh, it's a link to everything there. And um, yeah, it's easy. And then a reminder, I've included a YouTube playlist in the show notes so you can go through and just click and listen to a bunch of these records we're talking about. Um, and thanks everybody so much for uh, putting in the time to listen to us hang out. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It's always fun to talk and nerd out about studio stuff. Indeed, man. Well, it's a pleasure to meet <laughs> you and hang out with you. And I look forward to coming up and seeing the studio in Pittsburgh at some point. Yes, I'll definitely get an invite. All right, man. Thanks so All much, right. Dave. We'll see you around the Thank studio, you. dude. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.